Hello everyone, James here, and you join me on my holidays. Well behind me is the fantastic Gibson Mill, just outside Hebden Bridge in Yorkshire. But we'll save this for a future video. Today's video is about the design and 3D printing of a miniature servo mount. I hope you enjoy it. On the desk in front of me here, I have a miniature servo motor. Now these are the kind of thing which is used in model aircraft to control the control surfaces. However, they're increasingly used uh, on model railways for controlling things like points and signals. Indeed, I'm going to use four of these things to open and close the doors of the shed uh, for, the, for, for Sandling Junction. However, now that the baseboards for Bexhill West are complete, it's got to be thinking about the track work and the bits and pieces that I need to control. So I've designed a number of different mounts. Now this is just one of them. So this is a simple 3D printed unit that the servo will fix into. And it's quite a nice tight fit. There we go. So that's got screw holes. And I'll be able to screw that underneath the baseboard and use that to hold the servo whilst that's operating my points and signals and various other bits and pieces that I have in mind. So the purpose of today's video really is to talk through the process of 3D printing in, in some detail. But I'll begin very briefly by showing you the design work of this um, and how we go about creating you know, the, the file that the 3D printer can understand from the CAD software. What we have on screen here is a 9 gram servo motor and a mount that I've designed for it. And if I slide the servo motor back, you can see how it's going to fit into that mount. Now the idea is I'm going to use this for point and signal control. In fact, I've designed several mounts that will hold servos in all sorts of different configurations. And I've made some mounts that will hold multiple servos. Anyway, for now, what we're really interested in is this grey piece. This is going to be the element that we're going to 3D print. Now, one of the great things with 3D printing is that in designing the part we want to print, we can also design it to uh, sort of interface or work well with um, other components. So I've been able to take the dimensions for this servo motor, I've just got those straight off the internet, I've been able to copy those to draw that precisely so that I know that the mount that I'm going to print is going to work, um, it's going to work first time round and should, you know, should all fit together beautifully. So there's the back of the unit and the top. Now, there will actually be a separate piece which will attach onto the top of here and we'll talk more about that when we come to fit the points onto our model. But for now, that's our mount. So let's have a go look at what's involved in 3D printing that component. So in my 3D CAD software, and on this occasion I'm using SolidWorks, I've got the drawing for this, this servo mount. Now I won't go through the process of drawing this now, but we will maybe come on to that a little a little while later. But once we've got a 3D drawing, what we need to do is to convert that into a format that our 3D printer can understand. So I come up to the top of my screen, click File, Save As, and let's save as a copy and continue. And as a file type, instead of saving it as a SolidWorks file, what we're going to do is save it as a .stl, which I believe stands for stereolithography file. So we'll choose .stl, we'll call it servo mount, and what I'm going to do is save that into the folder in which I'm putting all of the, um, the files for this particular video. So there we go, we call it servo mount, click save. Now we'll just click yes. And what that computer has now done is converted that 3D file into a format that the 3D printer software can understand. So let's have a look at that. So this is Chitubox. This is the software that the 3D printer 
uses. Now my 3D printer is an Eligu Mars printer and this is the software that was supplied on a little USB memory stick. Um, it was supplied with the machine so I simply took the memory stick out of the box, put it into my computer and installed the software. Now what we could do is open our part file so I'll navigate back through to the folder where I've just saved it. So it was this one here and there's our files called servo mount. So click open and the servo mount appears on our screen. And what we could do is we can rotate this around and have a look at it from different directions. The first thing we need to do is think of a strategy for how we're going to print this. Because there are clearly some, some orientations of certain parts that will uh, just not print, not work out very effectively. So what I think I'll do is this face, which is the top face of this part, I'm going to make that my um, the, the face of, from which I'm going to build. So using the tools that are on the, the left hand side of my screen here, I could just rotate this round. Sorry, that's the wrong tool. I'll use this one. And what am I doing? That's it, this tool. I'm just going to rotate that round through 180 degrees. Now what I can do is actually come to this box here and type in 180. And there we go. So there's our part and that's pretty much ready for 3D printing. Except what we need to do is just elevate it off of the bed of the machine which is represented by this, this grid. And to do that we need to add support. Now in G2Box it's very simple. In the top right hand corner of the screen is a little add support tab so I'll click on that. And what I'm going to do here is get it to do it automatically. So under the auto support tab, I just click all and that will generate the support that is required just to lift that off of the bed of the machine. And you can see these little cone shapes being used to, um, to hold the part. Now we can change the parameters of these cones. We can make different shapes. Currently I've got a ball head selected for the top. We can change all of those, but it's not really necessary. For all of my printing so far, I've just used the automatic function. Just clicked all and that's worked perfectly well. Okay, if I come back to the settings tab and click slice, what the computer does now is it generates a series of slices through this part. So if I drag this slider down, you can see our model vanish away. Now, if we look at this black rectangle on the right of the screen, that is in effect the screen on the bed of the 3D printing machine. And the white image that you can see is the image upon where the slice has occurred. So you'll see if I slide up through the different slices, that image will change. So what happens is the printer begins with its first slice down here. Now you've got to imagine if we look at this black rectangle, this is the base of our tank that is full of resin. So the very first thing that the machine does is it projects this image, this white image, which is our bottom slice. And it will hold that for a few, uh, a few seconds, uh, shining that light and the the light will activate the um, photosensitive properties of the resin and cause it to cure. And then it will move up to the next slice and the next one and the next one, pausing to illuminate the resin for each slice. And so that as it works through the slices, so the model is constructed. Now, of course, when it advances from one slice to the next, the platen or the, the build bed or the build plate of the machine lifts up by the height of whatever the slice is. So let's just say it was one millimeter each slice. It will, it will cure a slice, move up one millimeter, cure the next slice, move up a millimeter and so on. Now, of course, the, the slices are, are 
not one millimeter, they're, they're much smaller than that. And we can get a very fine print. So that's how it works. When we've done that, we would just simply click save and we would save that file wherever we want to save it. And I tend to save them onto the USB drive that came with the machine. So I keep all my 3D files on there in one place. So that's taken rather longer to talk through than it actually takes to do. We simply import our file, decide upon the support, and I always click the auto function, slice the, uh, the model, and then save the file. Once the file is saved onto a memory stick, we can transport that memory stick to the machine and complete the print process. So how quick and easy is it to 3D print a part? Well, let me show you through the process from start to finish um, and you'll see just how simple it is. Now, the first thing we need to do is set up the print head. So this print head has a ball and socket joint here and can freely float. So what we need to do is install that onto the machine and make sure that that's got plenty of free movement. And then if I zoom in onto the, let's move you down and bring you into the, the screen so that hopefully you can see what's going on here. There we go. Hit the tool menu, manual, and then this button here will bring the build plate down onto the surface of the, um, the, the machine. So you can see that dropping. So what we do now is very simple. So we place a piece of, this is just straightforward copier paper, under here like a shim. And this will lower down. Now there's a limit stop. So when it hits its extreme of its travel, it will stop just like that and hold itself where it needs to be. And at this point, all we need to do is just line up the print head, make sure it's nice and square, hold it down and tighten these two screws. Now they don't have to be up really tight. It's not necessary to, you know, you're not tightening the wheel nuts on your car. Just, just nip them up. And then if I lift this up, we can press the up button here a handful of times and that will elevate the head. Okay, at this point, we load our tray of resin, which I've got here. Now I've already filled this up with the resin. We'll talk about the resin in just a moment. Lock those screws and place the cover on. Now, hopefully you can hear the sound of this. It's not noisy at all. It's just a sound of a, sounds a bit like a computer fan, really. Okay, so let's zoom once more into the screen. And what I'm going to do, I've got the file for this servo mount saved on this USB stick, which plugs into the back of the machine, like so. And now from the menu, let me just check we're focused. I can hit the back button twice to take me to the home screen. Hit print. Now I need to select the file, which is this one here, servo mount, and it gives me on the screen a 3D display of the model that I want to print. And it's as simple as pressing play. And that's all there is to it. That's probably taken a little bit over three minutes to run through that process. But it's obviously a lot longer because I'm talking about it rather than doing it. And that really is all there is to it. Now, there are all sorts of settings and adjustments you can mess about with. But I've had results that I'm really pleased with just using the standard default settings. And I couldn't be happier. So let's zoom back out now. And you can see that that process has begun. And that's all there is to it, really. 
The display now shows what the LCD screen is printing. So this is the first slice of our model. And it will expose that slice for, I forget what the default setting is, it might be 20 seconds, something like that. And that will cause a thin film of the resin in the shape of that image to harden. The bed of the machine or the, the, the print table then lifts, it drops down again and the next slice is projected on the screen which causes the next slice of the drawing to cure. And then that process will slowly build all the way up until the part's complete, which in this case is just over two hours. And so here's a close-up of the actual build process. When the machine has finished exposing a layer, the table moves up and then back down into the resin tank, ready to expose the next layer. And this process repeats on and on and on, pausing just for a few seconds each time to expose the next layer. And hopefully you can hear the sound of the machine. It's not too noisy, really it's just the sound of a something like a, a large computer fan or something. Certainly you could leave this machine running overnight and it wouldn't disturb you. And here we have the finished print. The machine's finished doing its job, so I can turn it off, remove the cover, and you can see the part on the build plate. Now, with the Elegoo printer comes this plastic bracket, and what we can do is pop that bracket in place and secure the build plate like so for a bit, so that any excess resin can drain off the side. But in this case, what I'm gonna do is dunk that straight away into a little tub of water. Now, one of the great things about this resin that I'm using is that it's water soluble, so I can just drop that straight into the, the water bath. And with the brush that they supply with the machine, I could just clean up any excess Resin. Now it's a good stage at this point, a good thing to know at this point to just cover up the resin tank to try and keep the UV light off of it. And then we can see our part. We can use, just use the water to rinse away any excess uncured resin. Now it's worth not scrimping on this stage of the process. Take your time, thoroughly clean it and rinse it. Now there's a temptation just to stick this straight under a, a tap and, and just wash it off. Now that would be a brilliant way of, of cleaning it up. But I have concerns about the small uncured plastic molecules, sort of the polymer molecules ending up in the water system. So I think it's probably not a good idea just to flush this and flush the excess down into the sink. I think that's probably very, very bad for the environment. If we wash our parts off in a separate tank, we can then filter this water and reclaim um, the, the, the plastic particles and we could just throw those away and they can go to landfill, which isn't ideal, but it's a lot better than washing it down the drain. So what I'll do is I'll spend a few minutes cleaning this up and I'll use three tubs and progressively take it cleaner and cleaner and cleaner before finally giving a good rinse in um, clean water and a wipe down with a paper towel. At that point I usually use a hairdryer just to just to dry it off or sometimes I use my airbrush if I've got that to hand. Anyway that's the process finished and whilst I clean that up I'll set up and show you the curing process. So having taken our part from the printer and giving it a good wash, and you can see here it's still fastened to the build plate. We've got a number of options. Now, if we have a look underneath it, hopefully you can see the, hang on, let me try and focus on this. Hopefully you could see the um, support structure that was used 
to hold this thing off the bill plate. Now what we can do at this stage is use a pair of sprue cutters. Now these are, these are quite good. These were supplied with the machine and we can nip through those and remove them. Uh, and they work well. I prefer, however, to cure this part as it is with the base on and trim that off afterwards. So I'll show you how I do that. Now I might come in for some stick here in the comment section because my method of curing this part, which is still slightly soft, is a little bit a cheapskate approach, but it works. So I take a piece of tin foil. Now what we need to do is separate that part from the build plate. So we've got a, a sort of a palette knife tool there. There we go, that comes off nice and easily. And what I do is I lay that on the tin foil and I have here a device used for curing nail polish. I think that's what it's for. It was very cheap. I got it on eBay. I think I paid less than 10 pounds for it. And I just lay that over the part and fold it up like so. Now the, the nail curing UV lamp has a 60 second timer on it. So in 60 seconds time, as it starts to cure, I'll rotate the part and give it another 60 seconds and so on. When I get a bit of time, I'm going to strip it down, have a look at the electronics inside and see if I can bypass the 60 second timer and just have it run directly. But that is my curing setup. It's dead cheap, dead simple. Um, but do you know what? It works. Um, I will, in the fullness of time, make a more elaborate version. And in fact, if I, if I reach behind me here, I've got a little potter's turntable which I've acquired. My plan is to build a box with UV lights all around this and I will just motorise this so that it, I can place a part on and it can spin underneath UV light. However, that's a project for a future occasion. For now, this rather rudimentary setup works a treat. And even after just a minute, I can already feel that on the top there that's starting to cure. So I just rotate the part and keep going. And usually at this stage, there's other parts of cleanup um, that could be done. I give the machine a wipe down, etc., etc. So it's no trouble once a minute just to swap that part over and give it another exposure on another side. As for how long it takes to expose, well, I'm not sure really. About 10 minutes seems to do a good enough job. I think the longer you expose it for, the better the quality of the finished part. Now you can leave these things on a windowsill and sunlight will cure the resin just as well. However, I have found that if you put it in a window and forget about it and kind of differentially cure one side that's in direct sunlight as opposed to the other, which is in shadow, then the, um, the polymer can contract on one side and cause parts to bend and twist in all sorts of unpredictable ways. So I find this process works. And if you saw my video of a few weeks ago where I 3D printed a railway clearinghouse wagon under frame, but that thing was quite complicated and it cured a treat. So this system, however cheap, does seem to work. And in fact, after I can already feel that that's really quite getting quite solid now and it's only been in there for a couple of minutes. So I'll carry on with the clearing up and we'll come back to this in a moment. And here is the finished part after curing. And it's, uh, it's okay, it's surprisingly robust. It's come out well. Now, after curing, these bits I find just snap off nice and cleanly. And I just use a, a nail file thing here from the pound shop and that's the perfect tool for getting these things perfectly flat. I enjoy using that, that works a treat. Only takes a moment to get those those little last of the little pimples removed and there we go next to its brother that I 3d printed the other day now you could probably hear in the background the machine is still whirring I've got a little production run on the go I'm making several of these um, in different configurations but that's the basic part in fact there's another piece that goes on to here and we'll talk in detail about the um, the, the design of this thing in, in sort of greater depth and exactly why I've done it the way in which I have. This video really was just about the 3D printing. 
Anyway, before we finish up, I'll just mention this. This is the resin that I'm using. It's an Eligu product. Water washable photopolymer resin. This stuff to me seems great. It's the only resin I've used in the machine. I've had excellent results um, and I highly recommend it. But with the caveat that I mentioned previously, I'm not sure that pouring this stuff down a drain is a very good idea. So I really would recommend that you filter through your, your wash water. Um, and for that, if I just, excuse me a second, with the kit of parts that came with the machine, was a whole stack of filter papers. Now I couldn't find any mention in the instructions as to quite what these were for. And I've been using them for filtering my resiny water. Um, it's just so that I'm not putting any waste down the drain. And I'd recommend everybody using one of these machines to do the same. So there you go. So to wrap up then, let's try and answer a couple of questions which I'm sure will come in through the comments section. The first one being, does this machine come with any design software? And the answer to that question is simply no. It comes with the Chitu Box software which enables you to take a previously designed 3D file and slice it up into a format that the machine can use and we showed you in this video how that works. But in terms of creating your own 3D file there's no software for that. Now you've got a number of options one of which is to download a 3D file and there are websites such as Thingiverse is one that comes to mind but there are others where you can download 3D files and just print off in the same way as you might download anything off of the internet. Another option of course is to learn how to do the 3D CAD yourself. Now it's it's not a difficult process it can be um, confusing to the raw beginner now, as most of you watching this will know, I have a CAD series which is running alongside this one. And when we finish dealing with all the 2D CAD stuff, we will move on to 3D CAD. So in two or three months time, I'll begin showing how a raw beginner could go about creating files uh, to use with this machine. Another question which may well be asked is, is it expensive to run? Well, I don't think so. This part, for example, the software tells me that this has cost 30, I think it's 30 pence or 33 pence in resin to produce. Now one of the things that I really like about this type of machine is that of course you're only using the material to make the part. There's very little waste. In fact, there is some waste obviously, but th that's the only bit of waste. Um, and the unused resin can be reclaimed and reused another time. So I think it's quite economical. And of course we can produce all sorts of really interesting bits and pieces. You might remember this from a few videos ago. The, if I can get the camera to focus on it. Maybe if I turn it in an angle. There we go. The Sandling Special Headboard. And I've made some of those for a viewer as well. As for the quality of the prints, well I think they're very good. Um, there are maybe problems that I know some people have, have had with 3D printing. I've used this machine straight out of the box using the Eligu resin, using the default settings and it's enabled me to print some, some really wonderful bits and pieces. And you may recall this wagon under frame from a previous video with its sliding axle boxes. You know, I think basically for less than 200 quid I think that the output from this machine is really very good indeed. Now, I bought my machine from Amazon and the I've left a description, in the description is a link to uh, the Amazon page for this machine um, and you could go and have a look and check out the latest price. Now, that is an, I must say that is an affiliate link. So what I've done is I've registered as an affiliate partner with Amazon and the idea is that if somebody goes onto Amazon and follows my link and buys this machine then hopefully I might get a little, a little commission which will go towards making these videos. You wouldn't pay any more for the machine, it's the same price but just I guess I'd get like an advertising fee. Now I've registered for that program but I've not been accepted yet so I'm certainly not making any money on it just yet. But who knows if enough of you buy one of these machines following my link I might be able to retire. 
Anyway, that's an overlook of the whole process. And really the purpose of making this video was just to show you how smoothly and, and simply one of these machines um, can be run. Really doesn't take long to set up. Um, in fact, I showed you, I think from loading the, in fact, from leveling the plate to getting the first print going was probably about three minutes. Um, it's, it's really good, I'd recommend it. So there you have it, that's the process that I followed through the design and the 3D printing of that little servo mount. I hope you found that interesting. And I hope you find what's behind me here interesting too. This is going to feature in a video very soon. Until next time, take care everyone, bye bye.